Quake is a name that I have no doubt that you've heard before, a game that rocked the gaming scene and almost became as much of a household name as Doom. And yet its production was far less graceful than its heavy metal predecessor. Originally starting production all the way back in 1991 as a top-down RPG, its original concept shares almost nothing in common with the gothic shooter we ended up getting five years later. If Doom was id Software's teenage years, then Quake was their adulthood, no longer about having fun heavy metal adventures, but instead a dark and sinister world drenched in shades of brown and khaki where you take on the hell spawn of an HP Lovecraft inspired limbo. This sounds fun! You know, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Doom turned out to be a breakout hit, but what we got was far from id Software's initial plan. An open world with multiple characters and a deeper story, <laughs> does that sound like Doom? Well, Quake was no different, originally a game where you play as Quake, the game's namesake, traversing dimensions in a fantasy-like setting, fighting dragons with a Thor-like hammer that shoots lightning and comes back to you after you throw it. And much like Doom, that's not even close to what we got, with id Software returning to what worked in the past, just with a new engine. You've got a very Doom-like arsenal, a very Doom-like map layout, and <laughs> it's really just Doom in 3D. Now I can hear you thinking, what do you mean Doom in 3D? Doom looks like it's 3D! Well, I mean, kinda? I briefly touched on it before, but Doom's engine is really just the game drawing sprites in a certain way to simulate a y-axis. A way that you could tell is that there's no two rooms that stack on top of each other. But Quake is all 3D action, baby. Everything sculpted out of a digital block of clay. Though with 3D rendering and stacked rooms comes a new complication. How would you design a map to guide the player for a three-dimensional space? Id Software's answer? <laughs> you don't. If your favorite part about Doom was getting lost in claustrophobic labyrinths, then boy, you're gonna need to change your pants by the time we're done with Quake. To my surprise though, this wasn't too big of a deal. I'm not the brightest guy out there, and yet I was able to complete Quake without a guide or even needing to look up the maps of these levels. But that isn't a guarantee that you'll have a great time looking for your way out of some of these levels. Sure, you've got some of the returning arsenal with Doom while remaining consistent with the game's gothic aesthetic. All of your weapons are mechanical, the closest to science fiction we get here is the lightning gun, the new boy on the block. Likely a merging of leftover ideas from back when you played as a discount Thor, but with the team still wanting to embrace what they originally had in mind for the game. It's devastating at long range and will fry you medium well if you try to use it underwater. I should also note that I'm using the Dark Places source part of the game. This allows for more proper monitor scaling and has the option for some really nice shaders that give us a nice new look and feel to the game. But for the sake of this video, I'm going to be sticking with the classic lighting. It also adds some tweening to the animations a bit. If you look at how Quake was animated on the original software, the animations was 3D, sure, but it still looked like they were animated as if they were sprites, with the constant sharp changes in their posing. Tweening fixes that, smoothing out the keyframes for their animations. Uh, if you're wondering what tweening is, uh, let's take the strike. Let's say he's gonna move from point A to B with only two keyframes, one here and here. It just looks like it teleports from point A to point B. But tweening adds some intermediate keyframes in between, giving it a nice smooth look as it transitions from point A to point B. And that's exactly what Dark Places is doing for Quake's animations. Though it's not perfect. Though I do like these sort of blocky animations, I think that they have a lot of charm to them. Though what the heck is up with the weapon bobbing? This wasn't in dark places, and I fucking love this. Like, look at how he's just thrusting the gun out when he runs. Like, is this how you run with a gun? With Doom 1's episodic structure returning, it wasn't exactly confident that a pistol would be the best fit for your starting weapon, with the spread of a shotgun being much more forgiving for aiming. It just seemed like a good fit for the transition to 3D like this. John Romero also commented that mouse look would be too complicated for players transitioning to Quake's new 3D world. And I I can respect that, the shotgun feels really nice in this game while still being weak enough to motivate you to use other weapons. But jeez, could you imagine playing a first person shooter like this without a mouse? Yeah, no thank you. If I can't use a mouse, I'll use a joystick. But only if I have to. Though if you're not totally comfortable with this newfangled mouse look phenomenon, you'll have plenty of time to practice it here in the game's hub. Your difficulty and episode select will all be done here in this interactive area by entering the appropriate slipgate. Ah, oh, slipgate, now that's a cool term. I couldn't find anything about the origin of the word online, it just means portal. But maybe it's just the association I have with the word with Quake, but the word just feels so grungy and cool. Also, they make Mario 64 sound effects, so that always breaks my immersion. I'm sorry, that's just how I feel. 
technically this did come out one day before Super Mario 64, so I guess Mario 64 uses Quake noises? <laughs> Speaking of similarities to Mario 64, Quake is downright unsettling at times. With Quake trading Doom's heavy metal MIDI soundtrack for a soundtrack composed by Nine Inch Nails Trent Reznor, which on the surface sounds fucking awesome, but instead of the soundtrack being entirely rock and metal, it's just this dark and uneasy ambience. The only song that might get you to rock your head back and forth is the title theme, but I can't exactly be mad because that's what Quake wanted to be from the minute you enter your first slipgate and head to episode 1, shooting down grunts and diving into the world of Quake itself. You're constantly being accompanied by music that makes you sit back, constantly reflect, and always makes you unsure about what's around the corner, yet with just a hint of confidence that you're still some kind of badass that's able to single-handedly take down this interdimensional threat. We don't really want, you know, songs, we want feelings, you know. And that's the thing, the atmosphere of Quake feels so well thought out. It just works here. Sure, I'd rather be playing Doom and listening to the Doom soundtrack over Quake any day, but Quake's overall aesthetic and ambience feels so carefully planned out with its brown castles and catacombs, religious and demonic symbols, everything just feels like it belongs here. If something's able to make futuristic space grunts feel consistent with ogres wielding chainsaws and grenade launchers, as well as literal blobs that bounce all over the place in a cathedral-like setting, that's impressive. The world of Quake feels like you're not supposed to be here, as if you've stumbled into some trans-dimensional limbo where no living thing from the surface world is meant to coexist. Nothing in Quake feels like it should make sense, and that's why it works. Yeah, Quake is kind of a pretentious art project. I don't mean that in a bad way, but it does mean that you have to be in the appropriate mindset to get the full experience here. It'll also make you feel like you're on the verge of a severe anxiety attack and- oh, nope, wait, that's because I forgot to take my inhaler, hold on. The weapon variety here, though, feels a little bit bare bones, which is kind of ironic because there's more weapons than there are in Doom. You've got the shotgun, the double barrel, which isn't the super shotgun, so I don't care. No, the title of super has been given to the nail gun, a barbaric weapon once again continuing with Quake's gothic, rusty look. It fits well. The normal nail gun looks cool, too. That's all I got. Taking advantage of the 3D environment and physics engine, we have the grenade launcher. It actually arcs. Wow! It stands in as a weaker version of the rocket launcher. And this is alright. It feels a bit basic, though. I found myself getting swarmed a lot more often in Quake than in Doom, and there were many times that I just wished that I had a BFG or something similar to help me out with these crowds of the damned. I understand that a BFG might go against the gothic feel of the game, but that doesn't undermine how I wish I had some sort of crowd control weapon here. Though Classic Id has been famous famous for saying that the story in a video game is comparable to story in there's still very much a story at play. An enemy codenamed Quake has been sending death squads to our military bases through our own slipgates. You're the best man for this operation. Operation Count Counter-Strike? Okay. Find Quake and stop him. Or it. Spoiler alert, Quake is actually a giant tentacle god from the mind of HP Lovecraft. It is actually called Shub Word, I'm afraid to say on YouTube because I have no plans to get my YouTube account terminated yet. So for that reason, I'm gonna continue to refer to this thing as Quake, its codename. Now we all know that the name Quake was chosen for the game way earlier in its development, originally supposed to be the name of the player. So going back and saying that the antagonist is the game's namesake is literally an afterthought. But if I hadn't known this, and I didn't until researching this video, I would have believed that it was just thought out that well. Quake itself is vaguely shaped like the Quake logo, a logo that's seen all over the place in markings and shadows, something I didn't notice until my second playthrough. You can see stained glass artwork of Quake, giving the idea that this whole land, this dimension we spend a majority of the game in, has been completely overruled by the monstrous Quake. And that's really really cool. I love this subtle form of storytelling. It's just one of those things that you can't really appreciate until your second playthrough. Though her minions though, I can't exactly say the same about. I don't know what to say, the enemy variety here feels like a step backwards. I applaud them for trying, these are enemies that are moving in a 3D space for once and obviously their first attempt isn't going to be perfect, so I'll cut them a bit of slack and for their first try it's still pretty impressive. Sure we have a giant lightning throwing yeti and a human manta ray hybrid that spits venom at you, but at the very least they still feel like they belong in this world, it's still consistent with the game's overall tone. We've got knights that swing at you, knights that throw fireballs at you, grunts and guard dogs for the surface world, pre-alpha headcrabs, literal blobs, and vor! Oh no, no, not the vor beams! <laughs> 
These guys were hell for me in the first run of the game, but on my second run, that title belongs to the fiends. God, I fucking hate these things. In Quake, you're constantly running around at full speed, and you can jump too, that was a big deal. And you have all these mobility options that makes traversing the level much more neck-breaking than the games beforehand. So it's only fair that some of these enemies get the same treatment, but by god this is way too far. The fiend lunges at you, dealing nearly 50 damage, and they also have a bug that lets them one-shot you if you're not careful. These are the things that keep me from saying that Quake is a masterpiece. I'm sorry, but these bastards are just so annoying, it nearly ruined the game for me. Quake does have its bosses, if you want to call it that. There's only two, and we've got one at the very beginning and one at the very end of the game against Quake itself. Both of them being less of a boss and more of a puzzle-like sequence. With this first boss, you are literally just running in circles. Step on one switch, step on another, step on a third, boss takes damage, lather, rinse, repeat until dead. Be sure to call your doctor if you have a giant flaming monster in your basement for more than four hours. The game congratulates you by spawning in and giving a bunch of enemies as fireworks, and <laughs> that's pretty fun and self-aware. Or is it jibbing? Gibbing is a term that I believe started in Doom. It's when you deal too much damage to an enemy and instead of lying down for a quick nap, they'll explode into a handful of smaller models representing giblets. Hence the term jibbing. Gross, I know, but it's a step forward in terms of technology. Jibbing is also really important because you need this to kill the zombies. There's no other way to kill these guys. If you shoot them with anything that doesn't explode, they'll get back up. Quad damage does help, but if you don't have quad damage, you're not killing the zombies. We're told that at the end of each path is a rune, as in the episodes we're playing. With the first episode being dubbed Land of the Doom. <laughs> That's really on the nose there, guys. Ah, the quad damage. I love this thing. Represented by the Quake logo, turning your screen in nice blue and giving you such a satisfying twangy sound to your weapons when you fire them. <laughs> Holy shit, look at Quake Guy here. He's loving it. Yeah, I just called him Quake Guy. Shut up. I love the quad damage. It's the game's equivalent to the Berserk from Doom just being applied to all of your weapons. And the sound it makes is just so blissful. I could fall asleep to this thing if I wanted to. Episodes 2, 3, and 4 end without a boss fight. You just collect the runes and go. I never understood the runes. I felt like maybe they were part of a larger system that was just dropped at some point. They're just some sort of MacGuffin meant to progress the plot. You need them in order to fight the final boss of the game, but that's it. We don't know the significance of them. They don't do anything. They just sit on your HUD to indicate progress, like a badge of honor. It would be really cool if they did something, like maybe giving you like five seconds of a specific power-up. I don't know, that might be a bit too overpowered, but I'd, I'd love for these to actually do something, you know? Unholy altar shoot it immediately oh cool with all four runes being collected the path to shub demonetized is open with the hub world being engulfed by a giant sinkhole i always loved it when games give you these sort of visual indicators of progress it really sells that feeling of finality that i'm such a sucker for <laughs> if i was a betting man i'd say this was john romero's doing giving you the lightning gun underwater nice <laughs> If you haven't had a chance yet to figure out that the lightning gun kills you underwater, this is a great way to find out. Now, if only we can get an answer on if this thing is AC or DC. <laughs> The duel against Quake is simply an endurance match, similar to the Icon of Sin from Doom 2, facing off against her legion that feel like they nearly endlessly spawn while a spiky ball hovers over the arena. Using the power of this convenient slipgate she has just lying around portals us to the location of said spiky ball while it's floating around, and if you pay close attention you might notice that spike ball shifting through Quake herself. Telefrag, to kill another being by teleporting into the space that they are occupying. Yeah! You're a master now! Id Software salutes you. <laughs> That's a bit of an underwhelming ending. The Id Software part feels really ironic. Doom felt much more like an arcadey shooter. When I see pinkies, I don't see a big hulking demon charging at me. I see a wall that takes maybe two to three shotgun blasts to kill. But you don't get that same sort of feeling with Quake. Quake is much more immersive with its atmosphere, for better or worse. It actually feels like I've entered this bizarre world with Lovecraftian demons and monsters, traversing a world somewhat more grounded in reality than Doom. So this ending telling me that you've overpowered Quake and its software salutes you feels really out of place. The final boss was fun though, even more fun realizing that I can just rocket jump to the slipgate and skip half of it, but being around Quake actually kills you, 
So you gotta be really fast with it. And that was fun, figuring that out on my own. I didn't have the internet or a guide to tell me that. I just thought, hey, I wonder if I could rocket jump over there. And I did it. And that was so cool. Rocket jumping is something that I actually used a lot here. Often to skip chunks of levels I otherwise would have no interest in dealing with. Uh, like the final stage from episode 2. You gotta do a bunch of puzzles so that you can open a drawbridge to the final area. Much like Doom 2, I refused to save in the middle of a level, so I found myself dying and having to do everything over again. So I thought, hey, what if I just rocket jump over there? And once again, it worked. Quake's influence is still hitting the market to this very day, and man, I cannot talk about Quake's influence without bringing up multiplayer. While Doom 1 and 2 had their fair share of online multiplayer, it was Quake that catapulted an online deathmatch into the mainstream, using TCP and UDP protocols to speed things up and make online connection much easier for the time, something that's still used in a lot of game servers today, and was made even easier with the addition of Quake World. However, the system doesn't seem to work all that great today. I was able to connect to some servers, but the first two took upwards of 10 minutes to download, and so I just gave up on that. I was able to connect to a third, and by connect, I mean it crashed the game as soon as I got in. Did it just crash? It just crashed! <laughs> Clean your goddamn desktop, Jesus Christ. Thankfully today we have Quake 3 or Quake Live to quench our classic Quake Online thirst. But the classic Quake multiplayer scene is still surprisingly strong today. Hell, it was at this year's Too Many Games in the arcade. They had an area set up just for it, not Quake 3 like I expected, Quake 1. I didn't get any footage of it unfortunately, but it was a lot of fun facing off against random people from across the world that I didn't know, except this time they're sitting 5 feet away from me. If it's there again next year, challenge me, I dare you. You'll beat me, I guarantee it. It's just a bit of a shame that I wasn't able to get Quake's multiplayer working over here at home. Oh great, it's another fucking Doomer! Well listen here, everyone knows Quake is better than Doom, okay? Everyone born after the year 1990 and not a fucking Doomer will know Quake is better. What was it? Say when you say ready. Ready. Set your team before you say ready. You ready, gamer? I'm ready, gamers. Oh. <laughs> just fell the lava. Oh, never mind. All right, we out here. Oh no! <laughs> oh lord! Oh lord! Oh lord! Oh, I killed you and I suicided. <laughs> ah! Fell in the lava again. That was Get back a here, bitch boy. Yeah, so much. This fucking lava! <laughs> oh! Bitch boy! Oh! Ah! Hold up! Oh! <laughs> 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 I don't even want to wake up from that one! Half of that was us just dying by falling into the lava. Alright, I'm ready. Unknown command ready. The fuck you mean? Oh god damn it, you're green. Oh, oh, I jumped to the lava right away! I found it. Stick looking steam. I'll take this. <laughs> no! <laughs> you dirty little bitch. <laughs> Say it again. Sorry. <laughs> Man, hey. I, I watched that half hour long video about, like, why Quake Champions is dying. I went in, like, it's probably just some fucking loser who doesn't like the game. And I came out of it, like, yeah, Quake Champions is dead. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this but is the, the day the trap guy dies. Oh! Y'all remember that Gearbox game that was supposed to fight Overwatch? You mean fucking... Oh, uh, Battle? Jesus. Not Battleborn. Battle was it Battleborn? Was it, Battle was it Battle yeah, yeah, Battleborn. Yeah, aka, we tried to make League, but with the... with the Team Fortress 2 style, and it didn't work. Rocket Launcher. Nope. Okay. Special thanks to my cousin Christopher for helping me figure all this out. You can follow him on Twitter, I'll provide a link to his Twitter and everything on all that. Uh, I actually had no idea how to set all this up, so, uh, thanks. Really appreciate it, man. Uh, okay, uh, b bye But Quake's accessibility wasn't exclusive to the PC scene. There were four ports of Quake planned, including a PlayStation 1, Atari Jaguar, Sega Saturn, and Nintendo 64 ports. But unfortunately, because of publishing problems, the PS1 and Jaguar ports had to be cancelled, only leaving Sega and Nintendo. I don't know much about the Sega Saturn port, but thankfully my pal Suavo from the N64 archive hooked me up with some information about the 64 port. Uh, this footage you're looking at is his. The thing that I find the most fascinating about this port is that it's missing Trent Reznor's soundtrack, but it's not that 
bad, instead being composed by Aubrey Hodges, the man who composed the soundtrack for the PS1 port of Doom. I still prefer the original, but this new one has a very nice sort of hip hop -y feel to it. I still prefer Trent Reznor's version, but you know what, if I grew up with this version, I wouldn't be too upset. The port isn't an exact conversion, it's missing like 6 levels from the original game, the HUD area with the difficulty select is completely omitted for a menu, and you don't even get the episode select, you just sort of go through the entire game in one linear experience, but it still strips your weapons after each episode, so uh, it's kinda weird. From the looks of it? This seems like a pretty okay port. Big thanks to Suavo again for helping me out with this. You can find a link to his channel in the pinned comment. But Quake's influence didn't just stop at multiplayer. Thanks to id Software's very open stance on modding, Quake saw its fair share of mods from simple level packs to total conversions, like Team Fortress. Yeah, Team Fortress started as a Quake mod. It's hard to believe where we'd be in the gaming market if it wasn't for Quake. Uh, again, sure, I still prefer Doom over Quake, but when it comes down to its influence, I can't deny Quake's legacy. And the catalyst for its success was a team who loved to see their community create, build, and innovate on what they had already created. And in a world today where mods and fan projects are constantly getting the axe, it's just refreshing to see a studio that was once there for the little guy. Now it'd be one-sided of me to come out and say that Quake's success came without faults. As id Software had just come off the heels of Doom 2, public expectation was high, and the team at id really pushed themselves with this one. Midway through, they decided to move everyone's desks into a single room hoping that it would help productivity, but instead it just caused a lot of infighting with the team, and the cracks between our two Johns were starting to break, and shortly after the release of Quake, John Romero left id Software. Obviously, id Software continued to thrive afterwards, but for a while, it just wasn't the same after John Romero left. But maybe it was for the best. People outgrow their friends. People drift away from each other. It happens. And hey, with John Romero being free, it might be interesting to see what he comes up with. Oh, wait, wait, no! Quake is a really just bizarre game. It's really experimental both with its themes and with its gameplay. Its gameplay is legendary, and its code is still used in games today. You can find bits of the source code for Quake inside of Half-Life 2's code, and that same engine was used to make Titanfall 2. Quake is freaking everywhere today, whether you know it or not. I almost considered making this a double feature with Quake 2, but the video got a bit longer than I anticipated, so I'm gonna save that for a future video. But Quake 2 does fix a lot of the problems I have with Quake. It has a really rockin' soundtrack, and it has a BFG in it too. The BFG 10,000, and the way that the BFG 10,000 works is very similar to how it works in Doom 2016, it's kinda interesting. But Quake 2 isn't gonna be part of this sort of Doom marathon that I've been doing. I only detoured to Quake because it's kind of important for future titles. I'll probably look at it next year though. But in the meantime, thank you for making it this far in the video, I really appreciate it. This video was kinda tricky to make. After I recorded my voiceover for it, I started the extreme video because I was kinda struggling to figure out how this video worked, so if you liked it, please let me know because frankly I'm kinda nervous how this one turned out. But of course I couldn't have done it without my patrons, and especially my $10 plus patrons, people like 1UP Commentary, Chef Kilo, EMT Neutrino, I Am The Pokemon Master, Otaku, Slim Jim's Media Bin, The Basis Luigi, The SideQuest Gamer, and Virginia H. Got a few new names on there, it's gonna be difficult to keep doing that with a single breath. But anyway, yeah, thank you a ton for watching. Uh, be sure to check out Suave and Christopher. Christopher? Christopher. They did help with a good chunk of this video, and I really appreciate it. But anyways, guys, I'll see you next time with Doom 64. I'm really excited for this one. Anyways, take care, guys.